Well, hey guys, it's Dr. McDonald. Um, it's time for us to get started on our next chapters. Chapter six is bone tissue. Now, this is going to involve a lot of physiology, so there's a lot of slides on this presentation too. So I might even have to do two or three videos to try to keep to my 30 minute time limit that I like. Okay, having said that, let's jump right on in. As far as, ooh, let me uh, adjust myself so I'm not blocking everything. Okay, there I am. Bone itself is a connective tissue. Um, we talked about that in chapter four. Very strong, very light. It has certain special cells and a lot of protein fibers, collagen specifically. Bone is not dead, although most of it is non-living. There are a lot of cells in the bones. It also is not fixed in one particular way. It's always changing. We're always breaking it down in one area and building it up in another depending on what we do uh, physical our activity it's called bone remodeling we'll talk a lot more about that each bone is going to change in response to the to the physical activity or the stress if you would that you put on that okay the skeletal system itself, if you look at this, this I don't know what you call that, a tan or a brown or a red, whatever it is, that's the axial skeleton. That is the, basically it's the skull, the vertebrae, and the ribs. The sternum or the breastbone right there as well. And again, we talked about this, there's a lot of cartilage, hyaline cartilage, we have them over the ends of our bones to keep them from rubbing together. We also have them between the ribs and the sternum. And we've talked about that as well. Skeletal cartilages, this is hyaline. It has no blood vessel, no nerves. There's a dense connective tissue around it called the perichondrium. And that's going to have the blood vessels and everything, the life support system for that cartilage. Still, cartilage, when it gets damaged, heals very, very slowly. Okay, the hyaline cartilage support flexibility, and it's the main type. The elastic cartilage is very similar, but they got elastic fibers. The elastic cartilage are mainly your ears. As far as the skeletal system, I can't really think of any place where you'd find it. Fibrocartilage, these guys have a lot of strength and they're good for compaction. And these are between our vertebrae. And we'll see more about that. Cartilage grows. Appositional means growing wider. So if I'm doing this, I'm just getting wider, greater diameter. And all they do is just put new cartilage matrix down around the outside of it, and it just kind of continuously enlarges as needed. The interstitial growth is how it grows long ways. These chondrocytes are going to divide. They're going to put new matrix, and they're just going to expand from the inside Calcification, cartilage is going to turn to bone at some point in normal bone growth, and we will talk about that, guys. Sorry, let me try to get this up so I can look at you guys. I keep, keep, keep missing where this guy's at. But the calcification is going to happen um, as a normal part of growing. When you are finished growing, when you're as tall as you're going, excuse me, as you're going to be, then the cartilage between the epiphys, between the head of the bone and the shaft is going to turn into bone from cartilage. And as you get older, some of the cartilage turns into bone as well. Okay, growth of cartilage. Wow, that's kind of small, but I guess I can see it. The appositional growth, the interstitial growth, and 
there's the perichondrium, the fibroblast are dividing, and you can see there's the, the level right there, and it just actually just puts more on it. And by doing so, it just kind of pushes the perichondrium away. Pretty straightforward, actually. These guys are just dividing and secreting new matrix. It's really fairly simple, not a lot. We talked about the axial and the, the skeleton. The appendicular skeleton is your arms, your legs. Um, the shoulder blade, we'll give it a name in a little while, and the hips. Those are all part of the appendicular. An appendicular sounds like appendage, which you know makes it easier to, to remember. So there's the axial skeleton, there's the appendicular, and again, notice that the hips and the shoulder blades go with the appendicular skeleton. Bones are classified by shape. Um, we have long bones. These guys are longer than they are wide. The little teeny tiny bones in the tip of your finger is a long bone not because it's way long, like, you know, two or three feet, but because it is longer than it is wide. What we call short bones, those bones are more, look more kind of boxy, like a cube. We also have a sesamoid bone. A sesamoid bone, you guys have heard of sesame seeds. You may have even had some, you know, you put it in a lot of stir-fried. But it, we have this, that's what our kneecap is, is a sesamoid bone. We also have them around our thumb and the, and the big toe. Flat bones, thin and flat. Some of them can be curved. The skull is a flat bone because you got two, sam two layers of, of dense bone in between um, the breastbone. The sternum is also a flat bone. The ribs are flat bones and they are definitely curved. Irregular bones are bones that you just can't classify because they have just such odd shapes. And most of the one that comes to mind is going to be the vertebrae because they have a very complex shape. And you can't really pigeonhole these guys into a, a certain category. So there's the sternum, the flat bone, the long bone. They're talking about the humerus. See, there's a vertebrae. You got this rounded situation and you've got a spine coming off there you got two spines coming off the side and so it just just call it irregular there's a short bone it's coming from the ankle but we also have those in the wrist we'll talk about that and if you look right there you can see the kneecap it's called the patella and that also is a uh, sesamoid bone all right guys let's continue on <laughs> What's bone for? Well, it keeps us from being a blob on the floor. It, it acts as a support. It's bracing, kind of like on the walls of your house, you have these two by fours, these studs, and then you hang stuff on the outside for the outside of your house, put drywall on the inside. This is our, our support. Also, it's gonna be a protection it's going to actually enclose things that are somewhat delicate. Our brain is enclosed in a bony helmet called the skull. Our heart and lungs are protected by the rib cage. I mean, it's not absolute protection, but it's better than nothing. Uh, the bones are also needed for movement. Muscles will shrink they will actually pull from either side toward the middle. And so if you've got a muscle like the biceps, it gets shorter and it pulls. If a muscle isn't connected to a bone, it can shrink. It's kind of like having a car engine without a transmission. The engine may work fine, but if there's no way to transfer the engine power to your wheels, then it's really not going to be much use. Bone is also where we store a lot of minerals. The hard part of our bone is made up of calcium and phosphate crystals, and that actually coats the collagen and makes the, 
the main matrix of the bone. Uh, so whenever we need calcium, we can break down a part of the bone and we can get, bring our calcium levels back up. In the, in the middle of the bones, it's not solid. It's actually got a lot of little braces and we'll see that in a minute. And that's called the bone marrow. Uh, they call it also the medullary cavity. That's where blood cells are, are made. We have stem cells in there, and those stem cells, based on the chemical signal, will either become a red blood cell to carry oxygen, one of, one of our many types of white blood cells to fight infection. So that's all that. Now, in children and infants especially, I mean, they're growing fast. They have to make a lot of blood, not only to replace the one that wears out, and blood wears out. Red cells last about four months on average, but they have to, to actually get ahead because they're still getting bigger. Now, for you and I, we only have to replace what we lose, you know, just wear and tear, so we don't have that. So a lot of our bone marrow stops being red marrow for blood cell and becomes yellow marrow, which is fat storage. That's where we store them at. We got yellow and red marrow. I think that's coming up too. Uh, bones produce a hormone called osteocalcin. That is, I've been researching it for the last couple of years. They've discovered it, but they haven't connected all the dots, guys. That's it's going to have something to do with obesity, with diabetes. It's it's going to be big. Um, matter of fact, I, when we get ready to get to this in class this weekend, I will look up and see what the the latest is on the osteocalcin. I, I do that every every semester to see what's what they found out. So the support and protection we already know about. Now for the long bones, we got the shaft and we've got two ends. The shaft of the bone we call the diaphysis. Now if you were to look at the bone shaft like this, if you were to cut it in a section, what you would see is you'd see a ring of very thick, dense bone, and in the middle you would see bone that was more like um, bracing struts. And that's going to be the compact bone is the dense. And then that spongy bone or cancellous bone, they, they got all kinds of names for it. But anyway, the diaphysis is, is the shaft of the bone. The heads of the bone, and there's two, are not really heads, but ends. We call those epiphysis. There's one, of course, that's going to be the proximal epiphysis, and one is going to be the distal, depending on, on uh, wherever they are. Now, as far as the head of the bone, that doesn't necessarily mean it, it can be distal or proximal epiphysis, so don't think that that's uh, a rule, because it's not. The epiphysis, they expand, and of course, just like this, the diaphysis, they have a spongy bone in the middle. Now, they also have something called the epi epithelial line. That is the thing that helps us to grow our bones longer, interstitial, like we talked about with the cartilage. And we'll talk more about that coming up, guys. And of course, we've got hyaline cartilage on the surfaces. And the reason is, I mean, we've got, we've got joint fluid in there, synovial fluid. We want to keep those bones from rubbing on each other because that causes the bones to have these little, kind of like bony icicles. They actually call them ossicles. And that can be very painful. Bone has a lot of good nerve endings in it. so. It can be exquisitely painful. That's why bone cancer is really horrible uh, because of all the all the pain caused by the mass pin pinching those nerves. But in any case, uh, that cartilage, when it wears off, gives us osteoarthritis. 
wear and tear arthritis, old age arthritis. But wear and tear is probably the most descriptive. Over a lifetime, you just wear it off and you don't naturally replace it. Now, nowadays, people do go get knee replacement, hip replacement surgeries, and that's all they're doing is, is they're, they're actually molding the bones and they're attaching metal or plastic and using that as kind of like an artificial cartilage. Okay, cancellous, spongy bone, uh, compact bone, which is the dense red and yellow marrow. We've already kind of talked about all that. Now here's a picture, and let me move me out of the way. Okay, so this is the femur, this is the bone in your thigh. So that's the actual head of the femur, but that's also the proximal epi epiphysis. This long portion right here is going to be the diaphysis, and this portion right here is going to be the distal epiphysis. There's also a metaphysis that's between the shaft and the, and the ends. I don't think they actually, I don't think it goes. Right here, they, you can see right there where you got this real thick bone right in there around the outside and inside it's more open and spacious so that we can do things in there. Okay, now let me get back up here out of the way. Okay, around the bone, on the outside of the bone, you got something that's kind of velvety. It's called the periosteum. Yeah, we just talked about the perichondrium. This is going to cover the external surface of the bone, the outside. You have a fibrous layer, which is going to be dense, irregular, connected tissue. Remember those guys, like in the skin, these guys are going to hold that covering onto the bone no matter what stress it gets on it. Underneath that you're going to have the osteogenic layer. This is going to be the one closest to the surface of the bone and there are going to be the stem cells that are going to give rise to the to the other bone cells with the exception of something called osteoclast. I'll tell you about that coming up. These guys are held on to this actual bone by things called perforating fibers. They also call them Sharpie's fibers. These things kind of embed in, in the bone itself and keeps the this guy on. A lot of nerves in there too, guys. That's why broken bones hurt so much. Uh, oh, there's it is. Now, so that's for the outside is the periosteum. On the inside, that's that spongy bone, and I don't, probably can't see as well, but these guys, instead of being bone that's solidly, densely packed together, these guys are going to have like little braces that go in all different directions. Those braces are called trabeculae. Those guys are also covered by that, that kind of felt, but since they're not on the outside of the bone, they're called endosteum and lines the canals that pass through the compact bone. We haven't got there yet, but um, you can kind of see there's compact bone and there's there's a blood vessel that's going up. There's actually blood vessels, artery and veins, and nerves that come up through here. So the, these are also lined with the endosteum. Periosteum, endosteum, Spongy bone, they call it diploe, only in the flat bones. The bone marrow is between the trabeculae. So, let me see if, uh, there we go. There's a spongy bone. You can see it's just a bunch. It's a lot of open space. And there's the compact bone. You've got compact bone on both sides. And in between you have this diploe or spongy bone. This is going to be in the in the uh, in the skull. These guys have bone marrow but they don't have a marrow cavity. This is it. Okay guys. Long and flat bones. Okay here's an example of flat bones. We've kind of talked about that. The These guys, the ribs, the sternum, 
this is the shoulder blade, also called the scapula, and the, and the bones of the skull are going to be flat bones. Short bones, these guys are going to be kind of boxy. These are the carpal bones. There are eight bones that make up your wrist that connect the hand to the arm. Uh, these guys, again, they are, they're, they're more box-like, cuboidal. There's a sesamoid bone from the patella. It's right in front of the, the junction between the femur and this other smaller leg bone called the uh, tibia. These guys are actually floating inside a tendon, so the muscles on the front part of the thigh have a big tendon that goes and attaches down here, and this guy is embedded in that. Okay, and again, it's just your kneecap. The irregular bones we've already talked about, complex shapes, um, these guys just don't fall into any easy categorization. And right in there, and there's the epiphysis, and here's the diaphysis. You can see all the spongy bone with the compact bone. You can see the, the medullary space. So for us, we generally don't use our long bones for blood cell production. Children do. We use the, the red marrow in the flat bones. Now, if you lose some blood, whatever, you can take that yellow cavity and turn it right back into red marrow. So the yellow marrow can be converted into red marrow in a pinch to boost red cell production. So it's not a, it's not a forever it's not forever lost. It's just temporarily we're using it for storage for fat because we actually don't need that. We make we have enough blood cell uh, production capacity in those flat bones without calling on these guys. Okay, oops, I'm in the way again. Let me move me way over the out of the way. Okay, guys, so again, there's the spongy bone with the endosteum. There's a yellow marrow. It's just fat. The compact bone, pretty much well the same thing. Uh, spongy bone combination. Make our blood cells there. Okay, talking about the cells. It's time for us to go go into that. We have what we call the osteogenic cells. These are stem cells. They also call them osteoprogenitor. They're the stem cells in the periosteum and the endosteum, and they will develop into osteoblasts. Osteoblasts are the cells that make the collagen fiber, which is later coated with that crystal to make it hard. So bone forming cells. Now, once the osteoblasts have made this matrix all around themselves, they're actually kind of like painted into a corner. They are, they're going to be in a lacuna just like car cartilage. And they are going to change from an osteoblast to an osteocyte. What's the difference between these guys? Osteoblast is a construction worker. He's making stuff. Osteocyte is like a maintenance worker. He's just maintaining what's already been made. Now we have another guy, and this doesn't come for the osteogenic. This actually comes from macrophages, and they're called osteoclast. These are the guys that are going to dissolve the, car the calcium phosphate crystals off of that and release the calcium. And sometimes we do that because we're remodeling. Sometimes we're just trying to keep our calcium levels high. Okay, guys, here's some pictures. There's an osteocyte. That's a lacuna. That's just a, it's, it's made all this matrix around and it's kind of trapped in this little island. Now, these little guys are canaliculae 
these are these are pathways for nutrients and waste materials to flow from these cells that are kind of off by themselves to get back to that to that uh, blood vessel in the center osteoblast immature cells uh, Mature, immature. I don't know if I would say that. They're the workers that are they're making that. Those are osteoprogenitor cells, and then the osteoclast. Actually, what happens is a lot of macrophages kind of merge together. It's a big multinucleated cell. It's going to secrete an acid that's going to dissolve the bone. Now around here, it's got a it's got like a uh, fringe that actually keeps it from spilling over into any area that it doesn't need to be in. Okay, let's see if I can get a little bigger so you guys can see me. <laughs> Not that you'd want to see me for any reason, but it used to be nice. Okay, so there's again the osteogenic, it's a stem cell, the osteoblast, this is a guy He's not going to make bone per se. He's going to make the collagen, lay it down, those fibers. It's like a specialized kind of fibroblast if you want to. And then the calcium and the phosphate are going to kind of like coat it and make it hard. And that way our bones are hard, but they're flexible. Because if they were just hard like marble, if you've ever had marble count counters you may or may not have at some point seen them shatter parts of them something that's really hard is also very brittle and so the collagen fibers give it a little bit of flexibility so that we can bend a little bit and not just always break okay osteoblast come the osteogenic these guys do not do mitosis. The only thing that does mitosis are the osteoprogenitor cells. These guys are going to do the the fibers, the prostaglandins, glycoprotein, oh, I'm sorry, those are proteoglycans, and glycoproteins, which is not ossified. Ossified means that it doesn't have the calcium and stuff on it. That's called the osteoid. That's a lot of ost words in here guys you're just gonna have to kind of get the meaning of them so it's going to lay down the fibrous and and organic chemical part mineralization is going to also require the osteoblast these guys can be either cuboidal to columnar in shape their cytoplasm is going to be kind of bluish they're usually found on the margin of the bones on the outer edges because that's where you need to lay it down. Uh, when they get surrounded by the matrix, they just lay down. They, they develop into osteocytes. These guys have receptors for parathyroid hormone and growth hormone. But actually, um, parathyroid hormone works well. The parathyroid is going to actually work on the osteocytes, and then they're going to send signals to the osteoclast. Parathyroid hormone is what we use when our blood calcium is too low, so we send a signal to the bones for them to break down a little bit of bone and release calcium. And so this is this is kind of the, the chain of command, as it were. So there's an osteocyte. It's just in maintenance mode. And there's our osteoclast, and there's that ruffled border. And you can see it has multiple nuclei. It produces a very strong acid. Uh, let me get myself off of here. There's the osteoclast. You can see that groove where they have dissolved it. These guys are capable of moving. Um, resorption means to reabsorb the calcium that we put down there. We absorb the calcium through our GI tract, then we use it to build the matrix of the bone, and then we reabsorb it. Resorption is something you're going to run into in AMP2 a lot too. The osteoclasts are going to be in these kind of little depressions that they themselves made. These are called Hauschip's lacunae, but you really don't need to know that. 
Uh, and of course the ruffled border we've already talked about. Monocytes are going to fuse and form the osteoclast, that ruffled border on Halship's lacuna, which is the area of bone that they're actively dissolving. I don't know guys, we might be able to get this in two. I don't have much time left on my 30 minutes. So there's the osteoclast. It's going to use ATP. It's going to produce hydrogen ions because that's acid. It's going to it's going to bring in chlorine and excrete, or it's going to do the antiport for chlorine in bicarb out. And the chlorine, and we can get hydrogen from. Um, um, Hold on a minute, guys. I'm drawing a total blank. I only, I only talk about this every semester. Mm. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll think of it later. But the chlorine and the hydrogens we have make hydrochloric acid. This is the same acid that we have in our stomach, and it is very potent. Clear zone is the area around that ruffled border and these guys actually seal here so that these guys are not going to uh, leak out. Clear zone, no organelles, a lot of actin. Kind of helps this guy to hold on to the bone matrix and form a seal. The osteoclasts are going to break down the collagen as well as, as the acid to dissolve the calcium phosphate. And then the proteoglycans, it's going to take out every part. Its main function is to break down the calcium for our blood needs, but sometimes in remodeling, which we haven't got to yet, we'll also use the osteoclast and osteoblast to change the shape of our bones to bulk them up in one direction and maybe thin them out on the other, depending on how you use your, your skeleton how you use it in your work or your exercise or sports or whatever. Proton pump is going to allow, oh, I remember what it was now, it's carbonic acid, H2CO3. And if you take one of the hydrogens off, you're left with bicarbonate, which is what goes out. It's an anion, chlorine is an anion, so we stay electrically balanced. So you take the chlorine that you brought in, and the hydrogen that you just took off of the carbonic acid and you've got hydrochloric acid. Proton pump is what pushes the hydrogen ions out and the chlorine as well. Okay, how do we control these osteoclasts? We use cytokines and hormones. Cytokines are chemicals that cells use to communicate with each other. It's kind of like email or text messages between cells. These guys have receptors for calcitonin. Those really are not very uh, important and they don't work very well. But they do have it for thyroid hormone. So the thyroid hormone, which speeds up metabolism, will speed up the osteoclast but they don't respond directly to the parathyroid. They actually act on the osteocytes and cause it to release osteoclast stimulating factor. In other words, these guys get the signal from the parathyroid gland, we need more calcium, and they relay it to the osteoclast. So it doesn't, it's not a direct communication. The overwhelming majority of our body calcium is in the bone. We hadn't got to the muscles or the nervous system. Suffice it to say your calcium is super important that if your calcium is not in the in our range, homeostatic range, your heart and your brain might not work. It's hard to survive that. So calcium is super important. Well, guys, I've already gone 31 minutes, so let me go ahead and just call this one, and we'll pick up again when we come to the bone anatomy, where we can talk a little bit more about these structures. 
anyway i'll see you in the next video thanks a lot bye